Welcome back to another installment in chemistry at Monmouth Roseville High School. Today we're going to be looking at physics and the quantum mechanical model, part one of section 5.3. Now we just talked about different ways to discuss the location of electrons within an atom, different orbital locations, different spins, and things like that. But how did they know that electrons had to occupy these various orbitals? How did they know that electrons required specific amounts of energy to exist in a particular orbital? The keys to understanding the movement of electrons were actually found as scientists developed their understanding of light and its properties, as I discussed when I talked about Bohr and his desire to explain the spectrum of hydrogen. In 1666, Sir Isaac Newton carried out important experiments with light that led to the proposal that light consists of tiny particles that he called corpuscles. Twelve years later, the Dutch scientist Christian Huygens suggested a wave theory to explain the properties of light. For more than 200 years, scientists argued about these seemingly contradictory theories. But by the year 1900, most scientists had finally accepted that light could be described as a wave. Paradoxically, they soon had to accept that light could, at the same time, be described as a particle. Looking at the wave theory of light, waves have a basic shape to them, as shown in this diagram. We can see crests, shown as the upward pointing part of the wave. Three of them are shown in this diagram. We also can see troughs. There are three troughs, which are the downward parts of the wave. Light waves, also known as electromagnetic radiation, can be fully described by three basic properties. The first of these is amplitude. The wave's height from zero, which is, means from the point of equilibrium, to the crest. Now that point of equilibrium means that middle green line in this diagram. And the amplitude is marked over here on the right, spanning from that point of equilibrium, that green line, up to the highest part of a crest. Wavelength is another important property of light, and it's represented with the Greek letter lambda. You need to remember that because you'll see it in formulas. It's defined as the distance between two corresponding points on the wave. Most often this gets measured from crest to crest or from trough to trough, and it gets measured in meters. That's its standard unit. Frequency is a third property of light we're going to look at. It's represented with the Greek letter nu. The number of wave cycles to pass a given point per unit of time is the frequency. Its units are cycles per second, which can be represented as 1 over s or s to the negative first, but it has its own unit called a hertz, abbreviated hz. Now we see two waves shown here, one in red with a really long wavelength and one with the same amplitude shown in blue, but it's got a much shorter wavelength as can be seen. Note that the longer wavelengths result in lower frequencies because if this wave were passing by and they're traveling at the same speed, the one in red is going to have fewer crests pass a given point in a given amount of time than the one shown in blue. So longer wavelengths result in lower frequencies while shorter wavelengths result in higher frequencies and that indicates an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. One last descriptor for light is its speed. Now the speed of light is represented with the letter C and it's just the product of the wavelength and the frequency. So its formula is C is equal to lambda nu. The speed of light traveling through the vacuum of space is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now this value doesn't change by much when light travels through something very thin like the atmosphere, like gases, but it can change significantly when light passes into a much more dense medium, such as passing into water or into glass. The change in the speed of light as it passes into a new medium is what is responsible for the separation of white light into a spectrum as light passes into a prism. Sunlight actually consists of a continuous range of wavelengths and frequencies, only part of which is in the visible spectrum. So on either side of that rainbow you see produced on the right side of the prisms over here, on either side you're going to have some invisible forms of light that your eyes just aren't detecting. Here's a nice diagram that you should refer back to as we work the few problems that follow. This is the electromagnetic spectrum.
we can see that we start with really long wavelengths down on the left side with radio waves. And they get shorter as we go towards the right through radar, microwaves, and infrared waves. Then we get into the visible light portion of the spectrum, which is shown expanded up above the diagram, going from the lowest energy ones with the longest wavelength, 700 nanometers for red wavelengths, up through Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, till we get to the high energy end, which is at 380 nanometers of wavelength, and that's your violet end. Once we get past the visible light spectrum, we reach some very short wavelength, high energy waves that can be damaging, going through ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Notice in this diagram that the top part of the scale indicates the frequencies, and the bottom part of the scale indicates the wavelength. And you should note that because that will be important as we go to answer questions later. Here's a speed of light problem. Remember, we have the formula C is equal to lambda nu, or wavelength times frequency. What is the frequency of radiation with a wavelength of 5.00 times 10 to the negative 8 meters? In what region of the electromagnetic spectrum is this radiation? So we have to start with our formula, C equals lambda nu, and we plug in the known value for the speed of light. We also can plug in the wavelength. When we do so, we get this equation. Now to solve for the frequency, nu, we have to divide both sides by 5.00 times 10 to the negative eighth, and when we do so, we get 6.00 times 10 to the 15th hertz. Remember, you do need a unit with these, and since this is a frequency, it's in hertz. It could also be written as 1 over s, or s to the negative first, but remember that hertz is the accepted unit. Okay, now, we're dealing with 6 times 10 to the 15th hertz. So if we go back to the electromagnetic spectrum on the previous slide and look for 6 times 10 to the 15th, what we see, 6 times 10 to the 15th, is going to be uh, right in between, somewhere in between the 3 times 10 to the 14th and the 3 times 10 to the 16th up there on top. And that should be somewhere close to the middle, um, maybe slightly above the middle between those two, which puts it into the ultraviolet range. Now here's a second problem. What is the wavelength of radiation with a frequency of 1.50 times 10 to the 13th hertz? Does this radiation have a longer or shorter wavelength than red light? Plugging in for the speed of light as well as the frequency this time, and solving for wavelength, which is lambda in this equation, what we find is that the wavelength is 2.00 times 10 to the negative fifth meters. Recall this is wavelength, so its unit should be in meters. Now, what about that question? Does this radiation have a longer or shorter wavelength than red light? So if we went back to that spectrum, we would see that it has a longer wavelength than red light. Now, this is in meters, and we looked at red light in that spectrum, and it said 700 nanometers. So really, we need to put this into nanometers to understand it and compare it. Well, a nanometer is 10 to the negative ninth of a meter. So changing my exponent to the negative ninth, I have to move that decimal over four places which would give me 20,000 nanometers. Definitely a longer wavelength <laughs> than red light. Our final problem, what is the frequency of radiation, which has a wavelength of 7.00 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters? Now be careful. You should always read these questions carefully because as I've said, wavelengths should be in meters. So before we put this value in, we have to remember to change it into meters. And then we can answer the question, in what region of the electromagnetic spectrum is this radiation? So we plug in for our values. Once we plug in for our values, we get this equation and solving for nu, which is the frequency. What we find is that nu is 4.28 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Notice that we did not put in 7.00 times 10 to the negative fifth for the wavelength, but rather times 10 to the negative 7th, because we needed to change it into meters first before we plugged in. So the question then remains, in what region of the electromagnetic spectrum is this radiation? And the answer, if we look back at the spectrum chart, we find that it is in the infrared part of the spectrum.
I hope you have found this video to be enlightening and that it has helped you to understand this first part. We will continue in part two tomorrow.